welcome to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. I'm your host, Sam Mickey. And on this week's episode, I'm really happy to welcome Robin Beldman. Uh, she's an assistant professor of religious studies at Texas A&M University and an associate editor for the Journal for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture. Her work focuses on the intersection of religion, culture, and climate change. And so today's discussion is about the research that went into her book, The Gospel of Climate Skepticism, Why Evangelical Christians Oppose Action on Climate Change. So we had a really thought-provoking discussion, and I hope you enjoy it. All right. Well, Robin, thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about religion and climate change. So first and foremost, you know, the gospel of climate skepticism is about why evangelical Christians oppose action on climate change. More generally, I know you've thought a lot about religion and climate change. Are evangelicals like the main sect that's resisting action on climate change? Or is it more widespread? How do you see that in your experience? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I think evangelicals have received the most attention because of their political influence. Um, so we know more about them than we know about other religious traditions. I've always been really curious about like Mormons, for example. Um, you know, there's other religious groups that we could be looking at that we don't look at as consistently. Um, and so um, I think that they're the religious group that has the most potential, whose views have the most potential to kind of thwart um a, a large scale like international response um but but yeah i mean there's i feel like the um momentum is really growing for hopefully more research um, about other religious traditions right yeah i'm seeing more more work on religion and climate change gradually coming out it's been yeah. it's been a little slow to get going with any kind of really in-depth analyses and one of the things i really appreciate about your work is that you get a lot of detail and uh, so I'm curious, you know, one of the things, you know, I uh, grew up in Texas uh, around a lot of evangelicals and myself, not one, but definitely grew up around a lot, had a lot of evangelical friends. And, and so I know, uh, you know, at least anecdotally among the people I knew, the end of days, the end times was a big part of the way people would interpret environmental issues or political issues or basically anything really. Mm -hmm. uh, there was always this concern for the, the kind of end of days. Does that play any role? Have you seen that? Where does that come into your research? Yeah, it's a really good question. Of course, that's like one of the motivations for the study was just trying to understand whether beliefs that, that Jesus is about to return or will return soon kind of discourage concern about the future of the planet. Um, and just like you said, there's so many Christians who have like anecdotal kind of stories of encountering this. And then a lot of environmentalists, I spent a whole chapter talking about all the environmentalists who have said, yes, this is a big problem. Um, and so, yeah, so I just wanted to understand that more in detail. Um, and I did my research in Georgia, so not Texas. And I, you know, I always have to wonder too, like how it would have been different if I'd looked in other parts of the country. Um, I do think that that end time beliefs are really sort of unevenly distributed throughout the population, even throughout the evangelical population. I think there can be you know, certain churches that emphasize it more. Um, there's also certain time periods, like famously, like the 1970s were really, you know, kind of a heyday for end time speculation. And so I think a lot of people who talk about the influence of the end times to kind of live through that period. Um, so it's one of those things that can really fluctuate where if everybody around you is talking about it, then it feels really real. Um, but that level, if you look at sociological and anthropological research on end time speculation, it's really hard to sustain that level of excitement about the, uh, an approaching end over time. So there's just this kind of natural process where um, end time beliefs tend to kind of fluctuate. Um, and so, so yeah, I, was just, I wanted to understand if that kind of stereotype of evangelical saying, you know, to heck with the planet, we're going to a new, you know, like new heaven, new earth is rolling around, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, I just want to understand if there was um, any truth to that. and. Uh, what I found in my research in Georgia was it was very sparse. I mean, I was surprised how infrequently it came up. And the people that I talked to, I did focus groups and participant observation primarily, um, were among the more religious because the people who stick around to like, you know, come to a Wednesday evening Bible study and then go to a focus group tend to be the ones who are very involved. So you would think if that was like a big deal, 
then that would be, you know, if it was super, super common, then that would also be common in my focus groups. Um, but that view was not, and that was really interesting to me that um, it, was, it was just a few people who, when we started talking about climate change, would immediately click in and be like, oh yeah, that's another sign. Just like, you know, we've been hearing our pastor telling us at the end times. Interesting. Huh. And I can go on, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really curious about that. So it's like, it's not really as common and just community to community, person to person, it might shift a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So what exactly, when when the end times are influencing their perception, what exactly about it, right? I mean, the new heaven, new earth, that kind of stuff, you know, is there, what else are they thinking? It's kind of like they don't have to care for anybody around them because they know they're chosen or how, mm -hmm. how exactly does that justify? Because if the world's ending, I wouldn't think that means that you don't have to like clean up after yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, but in this case, it is this kind of like, oh, no, don't worry. This is a sign that we don't have to address these issues. Yeah. Well, I, I love that nuance that you brought in, because I think that's really important to keep in mind that most people, when they think about that idea, of, and I call it the end time apathy hypothesis, mm -hmm. that end time beliefs lead to environmental apathy. People tend to think about it as this like belief equals action, as if there's no possible nuance in the connection between the two. Um, but you know, just like you even were just saying, there's there's different ways to interpret teachings about the end times. Say so you do believe Jesus will return. Does that mean he thinks it's okay that you trash the planet until he gets there? Like, not necessarily. Right. Um, so it all, like the interpretation is where like the rubber hits the road, I think. Um, and, but what I found in my focus groups were um, the, the most common explanation um, was still, or like tying end time belief to climate change attitudes um, was not that, oh, the planet's gonna, you know, burn up so we don't need to worry about it, but that um, environmentalists are kind of creating this fake story about how the world's gonna end in order to undermine Christian teachings. Um, and so it was tied to the end times, but in a really different way than most people have suggested. Um, and so, yeah, so that was like really in interesting to me. And, and most of those of, um, I call those people cool millennialists because they, the terminology gets a little confusing actually. Maybe I won't even get into that. Like when you start diving into eschatology, the study of the end times, as you may know, it's like, ugh, there's a lot of terminology. Um, but anyway, most of them were climate skeptics. Like it was a very normative view among the people that I talked with and you know, various focus groups at different evangelical denominations, urban, rural, like climate skepticism was the um, predominant view. So in order to think that the earth is, you know, that climate change is a sign of the end times, you have to actually accept that it's happening. Um, so, so that also was another, you know, kind of interesting wrinkle that I think a lot of people when, when they're getting ready to write off evangelicals because of end time views, don't put that together that you're, you know, to think of it as a sign of the end time that you have to accept that it's real. Right. <laughs> that's not really what was going on. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, it's like, no, they, you can't think it's a sign if you don't think it's actually happening. Yeah. So then what you're seeing more is uh, that they actually, there's a tendency to think that environmentalists are creating this fake narrative mm. and that what the intention is environmentalists are trying to undermine Christianity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, it's... that's, that's seems paranoid in a way. Yeah. But, uh, but I, yeah, I can understand you just feel like, well, scientists are out to get us or politicians or somebody you just don't trust the rest of the world that has different beliefs you haven't heard of or uh, strange new information that's kind of scary. So you just like, oh, no, it must be made up. They're trying to trying to undermine us, just like people are, you know, we'll say academics are trying to undermine American society and things yeah. like that. There's no, always these ideas uh, floating around. Yeah, I, well, it, I think I went back and read Richard Hofstetter's essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. Like, I think that word paranoia, you know, paranoid in the way that he uses it is really relevant because it's creating this kind of conspiracy theory in order to explain why the secular world does not agree with your particular view. Um, and in that sense, I think it really draws on the same paranoia that you see related to evolution in the sense that like evolution was you know, a lie also in order to like, that intends to undermine Christian teachings about the origins. So it's kind of like, you know, on the one side, creationism is a way of fighting back against, um, you know, the science of evolution. And then the skepticism of climate change was a way of pushing back against the secular narrative about the future. Um, so yeah, it was, it was like oddly symmetrical in, in that way. 
Um, but over time, I, I ended up um, not thinking that that was just sort of an automatic outcome of, oh, well, evangelicals are really serious about the Bible. They have a high regard for the authority of scripture. Therefore, they must, you know, you know, interpret things this X, Y, or Z way. Um, but realizing that because of the way the community is, um, that interpretation happens within communities, that that I, that way of interpreting it was had been suggested and encouraged by leaders in the Christian right, um, who ended up getting swept into this anti climate change backlash campaign within that was sort of specific to the evangelical world. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't just about these like abstract worldviews that were pushing people, but also leaders and like you know pundits within that religious community encouraging people and like nudging them to interpret it in a particular way. Right. That seems like a really important point. I know, I don't know, in, in general with the field of, you know, religion and ecology or studies of religion and nature, there's, there's often this kind of assumption that the worldview really dictates the behavior without this important role of the community mediating that. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't just like, oh no, the Bible is going to lend itself toward these interpretations. That's the worldview. Like, no, there's leaders that are putting their finger on the scales there and kind of pushing people yeah. this direction. Would you say that was the same thing, you know, with evolutionary science, climate science, also, uh, what, epidemiology and, you know, the study mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the way that coronavirus has been handled in uh, evangelical communities? That's such a good question. Um, and um, I think that dynamics are changing within evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, given that evolution really came to a head in the early, in like the 1920s, like the debate within um, Christians, evangelical Christian circles and climate change within the 2010s and now coronavirus, obviously. Um, I think I was just reading um, somebody, uh, a, a evangelical, evangelical reporter who worked for the um, Christian Post, which is a pretty important evangelical um, newspaper. And he was saying that he doesn't feel that there's a, even a mainstream of evangelicalism anymore. I think it's mm -hmm. like, um, yeah, I just, I think that um, the way that information circulates throughout the, through the community has really changed so much, especially in the digital age mm -hmm. um, and the proliferation of online misinformation. Right. Um, this is something I'm trying to really understand better right now. Like I don't have a, a, a like a, fully accurate view of it, but I just, you know, my time in the field really made me understand or come to the conclusion that, that at least within evangelicals, media is an, an important um, source of way in which they come to a particular understanding of contemporary issues. Um, and so I've definitely seen similar things going on with coronavirus, like the main climate skeptic organization. I, I just looked back recently the first email that that climate skeptic organization, the Cornwall Alliance, sent out on like March 13th, you know, 2020 said there will be at most 37,000 deaths in the United States. And that's even beyond imagination and probably totally exaggerated, you know, so and he even the um, E. Calvin Beisner, who's the head of the Cornwall Alliance, even explicitly said, if you know our views, you won't be surprised to read this because it's the same thing we say about climate change. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I think the underlying thing there, the commonality seems to be opposition to like government intervention of any form. Hmm. Um, and I tend to not see it as anti-science in a broad brush because there's so many scientific issues that evangelicals do accept. It's just a few here and there, you know, that they have problems with. So, yeah, I see it more sociologically as like a sense of, as I talk about in the book, like embattlement with secular culture that's driving it rather than like, oh, I just don't like mm -hmm. science. Right. That seems like a good point. Sometimes you hear these kind of people making snappy comebacks like, oh, well, if you don't believe in climate science, then how do you believe in the science that makes your computer work? And it's like, no, they're not just against all science. And you're like, what about two plus two equals four? They're like, no, that's fine. <laughs> We're not against all math and science or any kind of knowledge. Uh, and yeah, it makes sense that the, like, the government intervention would be the thing. And they're just like, no, this one feels like it's getting too much in our world. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, right, if climate change is real, then that would justify the government doing all kinds of things to cut emissions. And, you know, that's going to affect our jobs and our communities. Is that, 
would you say that was also the issue with evolution that there were that the concern was also there might be some government overreach or there might be somehow some political control that that was no, it's interesting concern. that's a good question like i do think that's one of the ones where things have changed a lot just because that was a that was like a century ago um uh, a study that's really good by elaine howard eckland and some of her colleagues she's a sociologist at rice found that when you do kind of a, a correlation between religion and climate attitudes and religion and evolution attitudes that religion for evangelicals pretty much explains attitudes towards evolution, but it is not as it's, it's correlated at a much lower level um, for climate change. Hmm. And the way I interpret that is not that religion is irrelevant with climate change, but that's become very inextricably entangled with politics in a way that's hard to measure via a survey, you know, um, but I do think that um, evolution, the fight over evolution started this and also over, you know, higher criticism of the Bible, you know, like there's that whole history of how um, evangelicals divided from their, you know, mainline progressive brethren in terms of how the Bible should be interpreted. Um, and that started creating a cleavage within evangelicalism, or sorry, between evangelicals and like the world or the sort of the mainstream world. And so I think it, it started creating, it set in motion, you know, what would eventually come to pass with climate attitudes. But I think there are different factors specific to those eras right. that were driving it. Yeah, that's interesting, right? The politics are changing and then also the way the communities themselves are changing mm -hmm. and then adding on digital communication more recently. And, you know, one of the things I often wonder is, you know, where's the you know the unity of the evangelical community right is there is there any hub where they all can get on the same page in the way that you know patriarch bartholomew for the orthodox or pope francis mm -hmm. for catholics in some cases you know would that explain why there's so much variability between different evangelical communities yeah yeah that's um a really good point the i mean everybody takes the roman catholic church as kind of the counter example to evangelicalism because it's so hierarchical yeah. even there though it's interesting how you know with like laudato si and pope francis like it's not like everyone just fell in line so yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> authority is a tricky thing it doesn't yeah. really it's not like anyone's a dictator <laughs> yeah. um it doesn't translate as much as you might think it would um but yeah within evangelicalism it's super decentralized um, there is no one recognized leader. People build their authority by um, developing popular ministries. And oftentimes they do that through, you know, if somebody has a successful church, they get a bigger church. They might then start, you know, airing on the radio or airing on television like Jerry Falwell did in the 1980s. And then a bunch of people followed in his wake. And so that's one of the reasons media has ended up being incredibly powerful within the evangelical community as a way of agenda setting. Um, mm -hmm because because there's no centralized authority so it's really based on like kind of charisma and your ability to like attract a following um and so that also puts evangelical leaders in this tricky position where they can be replaced if they're not you know mm -hmm. saying if they're saying something super controversial or trying to push people a little too much like people might just decide to go elsewhere and i think right now what we're what we're seeing you know in 2021 is this tension between evangelicalism as a political identity and evangelicalism as a theological or religious identity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who's an evangelical climate activist, like way better known than me, <laughs> uh, or I'm not, I guess I'm not an activist, but like she has talked about this distinction um, as being really important. Um, and so there's, there are, you know, there are people who go to evangelical churches or even who may not go to church, but identify as evangelical because mm -hmm. of what they associate it with. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's kind of that group that's, that is probably the most um, likely to be skeptical of climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I would say rather than if you just do evangelicalism by theology and you include evangelicals of color, mm -hmm. then you're gonna see a much less strong association. So really, I mean, one of the fascinating things with evangelicalism is it depends so much how you measure who an evangelical is. Right. Um, and I, I think most people just have no idea that that's the case. And I never did, you know, reading the newspaper for all those years thinking I knew who evangelicals were. And then I like started doing research and was like, wait, how do I, wait, which denominations are evangelical again? And you have to, you know, I'm like pulling up my charts and tables and trying to figure out, well, how do you know these are evangelical? Like, 
Um, it's just really complicated. <laughs> That's a really funny problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I actually recently realized um, I have a colleague who does a survey with the national, it's called National Surveys on Energy and Environment. And hmm. they had some really cool um, data looking at evangelicals, um, white comparing white evangelicals to evangelicals of color. And there's really a remarkable and consistent difference between mm -hmm. those two groups. Um, so that, you know, just points in the direction of it's not just theology, it's like interpretive communities. Um, so I, I feel like even more convinced <laughs> of that conclusion than when I finished the book. Yeah. yeah, that's always nice, right? The more data keeps coming out, you're like, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure some things will be wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I guess you, can, you always want that to some extent. That's how we keep furthering the research. You gotta find you know, some, some cracks in it somewhere. Uh, what do you think is explaining the difference between white evangelicals and evangelicals are you know, communities of color? Why would, What's going on there where the um, where people of color are more willing to accept climate science and things like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I've been looking for research on that and have not found as much as I would like to find, at least on kind of like an ethnographic level, because that's right. what that's what I really understand. Like you can see it in the survey data, but I don't understand from kind of a first person perspective why that difference exists. Um, and I mean, there's some. I know that Amanda Bow, who may have been on your um, program, uh, she has been looking, working with Latinx um, Catholics, um, so not evangelicals, but uh, in the LA area, and they're much more um, concerned about climate change and environmental issues, but in a way that often is like, just doesn't fit into the normative view of what counts as environmentalism. So she has had some really interesting research there. Um, yeah, other than that, like I, you know, I, there's all, the reality that people of color get hit harder and will be hit harder by climate change. There's also probably the reality that they're less likely to be embedded in um, like media environments that are so consistently skeptical. Right. Um, and then they also haven't been targeted the way white evangelicals were. Hmm. Um, and so hmm. white evangelicals are kind of, it, you know, were. Um, there was some pretty consistent messaging going out in Christian radio um, from the period I looked at was 2008 to 2015. That was just kind of like pushing this climate skeptical narrative. But I mean, evangelical mass media is kind of what unites evangelicalism, but it's always been very much uniting a white evangelicalism. So I'm really wondering, you know, the extent to which evangelicals of color may not be as compelled by James Dobson or some of the other um, big players in, in evangelical mass media. And, and, you know, maybe that has an effect. Oh, well, that's so, super interesting. Okay. I think that's a pretty good place to go ahead and, uh, take a little bit of a break and we'll be back next week with the second part of the interview where we get into more details about, uh, Robin's work and more specific information about this intersection of evangelicals and climate change. So in the meantime, take care and be well.